Hi there, this is Alana. Welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Jamie. We're glad you guys joined us today, and we're going to be having a discussion about spiritual warfare and particularly myths surrounding spiritual warfare. So I'm excited about our discussion, and we're going to open in a word of prayer. God, we just thank you for your truth and just for revealing to us that there is a spiritual battle that we can't see. God, we just thank you that your word opens our eyes to that and your Holy Spirit makes us just more attuned to that. We just pray for more of that in our lives, God, and we pray that you would help us to pursue spiritual warfare in, in our prayer lives in a way that is biblical and powerful. Lord, we just pray for power in our prayer lives. We know that you're already victorious and we thank you for that, God, and for the privilege of partnering with you in unleashing your kingdom here on earth and in the heavenlies. Amen. Amen. So thank you to our subscribers and those of you who are helping us spread the word about the show. And a big thank you to Praying Mama, who left us such a nice review on iTunes. She wrote, this podcast was groundbreaking for me. I've always had a personal prayer life, but through the podcast, I learned to expand the intensity of my prayers by reading scripture, journaling, and praying together. This is becoming my nightly special time with the Lord. Their suggestions and examples and firsthand knowledge are scripturally based and personally used. Their ministry is so relevant. Thank you and God bless you both. And we want to thank you so much for the kind words and for being such a faithful listener and for leaving a review for us. Yeah, that's that's so sweet. It's just more encouraging than than we can express to hear that we're reaching people and that God Absolutely. is mm-hmm. God is working through the podcast. So our verse of the day today is 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths, which is just a great segue into our discussion about spiritual warfare and the myths that kind of could surround spiritual warfare because it's an invisible war. So we don't see it with our eyes. We don't see the the details of how it works and exactly what's going on in the spiritual world. We have a kind of a little bit of knowing. So we want to make sure that our understanding is biblical so that we can fight that battle more effectively. Right, for sure. And we're going to start our discussion with a just for fun question. Are you gullible? Yes. Okay, so when was the last time you fell for something? So my kids do this to me all the time. My oldest son, who's almost 13, is the one that like is he's the worst because he's really good at it. And and he will just come up with these things. Um, and I was trying to think of an example when I saw it, when, when we came up with this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't, I can't think of a specific one. But I they wish. get you. But he gets me all the time. Yeah, I know I, I should have some really good ones by now. But it's just, it's little stuff. It's just little things that, that he'll get. My son will do that a lot with like trivia. He'll be like, oh, did you know this about that? And like, oh, that's interesting. And then he'll laugh like, ha, I made that up. I'm like, well, I don't know. How would I know? Especially, you know, like if it's about the solar system, you know, like we learned yes. about the solar system 30 years ago, you know, back when Pluto was still a planet. And <laughs> so, yeah. of course, I'm going to believe what my son says. Well, I can think of a silly one. This isn't, this mm-hmm. is just kind of a really random silly one, but um, my son was at youth group and they have a wana there also. So they have the little kids there and then the bigger kids there. And so the bigger kids sometimes think that it's not as cool as it was before Awana started because they don't get the whole building to themselves right. where they used to. So they actually have incorporated the some of their playtime, like their games and stuff with Awana, I think. Mm-hmm. So he told me just something silly about, he said, yeah, tonight uh, we got to play with the little kids and we did dodgeball. They called it Big Little Dodgeball. Aww. It's a new game. And I said, oh, that's really sweet. And he's like, come on, mom, big little dodgeball. Like what kind of name is that? I just totally made that up. <laughs> well, yeah. Like why would you why not would you have believed that? that? So yeah. that's one of the like, you know, one of these silly examples of uh-huh. things that nobody even cares about, but yeah. I definitely am gullible. So yeah. 
I'm probably kind of midline, you know, yeah. like my kids will say things and if I have no reason not to believe them, I'll be, oh, that's interesting. You know, like my kids love to do our dining room table looks out to the backyard. I'm like, look, a moose. Hey, to look. I'm like, why would I have not have believed you when you point and say a moose? You know? oh, so I have a funny thing, actually. So every once in a while, I try to get them back. And so oh, nice. the other day we were sitting in the parking lot. My, my son and my husband ran into a store and the other kids and I were in the parking lot and they were like tickling each other and tickling me in the back seat. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to distract them. And I said, look, a unicorn. And I pointed, no lie, like seconds later, it's, it's a little walking sidewalk trail in a neighborhood across the fence. This little girl in like this unicorn blanket over her head with the horn and everything really? starts walking by. So when they That's looked, so there was this weird. girl. With, I mean, I could not believe that that actually happened. So yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah, did you tell them that you had made that up? I did. I said, I did not plan <laughs> for that. It really is a, yeah, I, I totally was going to try to just distract them from tickling. We're praying or we play jokes on the kids all the time. And it sometimes comes back to bite us. Like we'll pretend to be angry with them or something. Yes. And like last summer, we had to tell them that we were moving and we had to preface it like multiple times. You might think we're joking. We're absolutely serious, you know, right. and I felt That's bad because cried wolf. <laughs> I know. And they're just trying not to giggle. I'm like, we really you know we're like serious, serious, <laughs> you know, like we need a code word. Like I'm not just serious. I'm serious, serious right now. Yes. Oh my yeah. goodness. So anyway, we are talking today about just some of the myths that surround spiritual warfare. And, you know, it was really interesting what you were saying, Jamie, about how the spiritual warfare realm is unseen. And I feel like that's how like legends and stuff, you know, like even urban legends, like if there's no actual news report about it, they can grow so much bigger than life. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if the same thing is kind of happening with spiritual warfare sometimes. Do you know what I mean? I do. And I think you could go on either side of minimizing it and because it's invisible, True. not acknowledging it, mm -hmm. but taking it seriously, but then taking it too far and you know, mm -hmm. kind of like what the Pharisees did with the good uh, point, the law, you know, adding right. on these additional things, extra biblical things that were not necessarily true that were right. handed down by tradition or yeah. sound like it probably is it, or maybe you read it in a book and it sounded like mm -hmm. maybe that's the way God works. Or maybe it works well for you. I feel like a lot of Christians do this today. This is a thing that works well for me, mm -hmm. you know, and so I'm going to expect every single other person in the world to do it, even when that thing might not be biblical. It might just be the best, you know, like I don't, you know, take drinking or something. Mm -hmm. Lots of people say, I'm just not going to touch it because. I don't want to cross over any lines or whatever. Well, perfect. That is a wonderful um, rule to set up, you know, and yeah, certainly don't want to encourage people to go against their conscience and drinking. We've got to be careful about that too. Right. But we also do need to be careful to just because something is a conviction that you have doesn't always mean that it's a conviction that everyone around you needs to have. Yeah. And, and with spiritual warfare, it, it could be, the way you picture things happening in mm -hmm. the spiritual realm. I mean, in our part one, where we talked about just generally spiritual warfare, how to know whether it's spiritual warfare or not, we talked about how there can be, you know, these pictures in our minds that I think, you know, we've talked about imagination and prayer also, and how mm -hmm. it can be beneficial to picture what could be happening. Mm -hmm. It can be for sure. To enable and, you to pray better or more effectively. Mm -hmm. And yet we, we want to make sure we're worshiping and praying in spirit and in truth. So you could right. take it too far. So I'm just thinking of Agreed. some of those things where you picture, you know, I, I know that some people will picture actually, you know, well, a demon physically attaches itself to someone and it's riding around on their back and it can jump onto someone else. Like that sort of mentality or imagery Mm -hmm. that I don't necessarily see in scripture. I don't think that picturing it that way, because I mean, we know it, that when you, it, the Bible does speak the truth, when you associate with people 
they that are doing wrong things, it can bring you down. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a way of picturing your spiritual warfare. Like, please, God, don't let those influences jump over Mm -hmm. to my loved one. Or I see that person expressing a spirit of greed or a spirit of addiction. And is that just the sinful nature or is that an actual little personified demon on their shoulder? (laughs) Right, right. And so, yeah, so it's very, uh, I think there's a thin line or fine line of Mm -hmm. how that works or doesn't work. Yeah. And having the humility to know that however we picture it, our understanding is going to be lacking and incomplete. Right. And not to be either, like you said, uh, judgmental of others for not believing Mm -hmm. exactly what you believe Mm -hmm. on either side, whether it's overemphasizing the spiritual or underemphasizing it to give grace, you know, just like the meat sacrifice to idols, you know, live in Mm -hmm. harmony, look at yourself, pluck the, you know, log out of your own eye instead of the speck Mm -hmm. out of other people's Mm -hmm. and just, you know, focus on your own understanding of scripture and your life, I think. For sure. Yeah. So these are just some of the myths that Jamie and I pulled out. And I think sometimes myths start because maybe the generality or anecdotal evidence might point to something, but that doesn't mean it's a, you know, truth with a capital T. So because just because we're calling some of these things myths doesn't mean they sometimes don't happen this way, but we want to break it down and just talk about some things that some Christians take as absolute truth that really might not be. So one of these, and this is super common, it's the myth that says if you're doing God's work, you are going to come under spiritual attack. And people actually welcoming spiritual attack as a seal of approval that they're doing God's work. Now, anecdotally, we have a lot of people, like basically every single prophet in the Old Testament that I can think of, at some point came under actual, you know, attack, not necessarily spiritually, but they were opposed. And so this is one of those where I feel like, yeah, it's probably a generality, but it's not, in my opinion, a necessity. And I think what happens is sometimes people believe this so much that it actually keeps them from doing God's work. So they say, well, I don't want to do a podcast episode about spiritual warfare because if I do, I know that blah, blah, blah is going to happen to my family. And that's, in my opinion, that's giving more power to the enemy than maybe we should. But I don't know. I mean, I can see why people say this because anecdotally I can say that, yeah, this has happened to me sometimes in my life. But I think maybe the key is when you say always, I don't know. What do you think? I definitely agree that the always is is a factor. And I also think another way that it can keep people from doing God's work is sort of that martyr or stoic complex of, Mm -hmm. I love singing. So I'm going to work in the nursery because I would never... You know, God God would never want me to Mm -hmm. do singing because I love it. So I'm not going to join the worship team at church. I'm going to work in the nursery because I hate babies. Yeah. (laughs) And God is not going to call me to something I love. And so I think that isn't really necessarily a spiritual, like if I'm, if I'm not being spiritually, but it's the similar mentality. Like, yeah. Yeah, God wants us suffering. He wants us unfulfilled. He wants us, yeah, miserable. No, I'm not saying that he wants us, you know, happy and healthy and rich either, like every single minute of the day. No. But you know, I don't feel like we need to seek out misery because we're Christians. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But I think it can be a comfort if you are doing God's work and you're experiencing adversity to look at it as, you know what, I'm doing God's work. Sure. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be. And go into it with your eyes wide open for sure. Right. But yeah, but not not to assume that if you're doing God's work, that you're always going to come under spiritual attack. And, have a and not to wear your spiritual attack as a badge of honor, because I think people mm-hmm. do that, you know, kind of a, I don't know, in the same way that maybe like, um, what do you call someone who's always working out at the gym, you know, like a fitness buff or something, you know, like, oh, I'm so sore today, or I don't know if they really do that, I'm guessing. <laughs> but, you know, look at me, I'm so sore because I worked out. 
you know, look at all me. All the times so that I work out, I always do that. I'm always just like, oh man, I'm so sore. No. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, I, I need to work out more. I don't work out very much. But do you know what I'm saying? How yes. some people will be like, oh, right. I'm, yeah, I totally agree. Sometimes when we do do God's work, we do come under attack. And yes, we do need to be asking people to pray or to pray for us. We do need to be wise and shrewd, but we shouldn't be glorifying. You know, like some people feel like the fact that bad things are happening is somehow God's seal of approval on them. And if things are going well and they're experiencing blessings they feel like they have to apologize for it do you know what i mean like sure, god well, sends right. rain on the righteous and the unrighteous and um sun on the just and the unjust yeah and i mean that that's the other side of the coin is believing if you're not being spiritually attacked then you're not doing god's work and you're not a threat to the kingdom kind of like well, I'm, I'm experiencing peace in my life right now. I must not be doing God's work. And I think we get kind of, we've talked about this in the like prayer meeting setting where I've said, you know, there are times mm -hmm. when I'm in a prayer meeting and I feel guilty when I don't have a prayer request. Like when I have or like something really, really bad and serious deep, you know, and mm -hmm. I think, oh man, all these other people are dealing with these difficult things. Yeah. I need to, conjure up something. And I think that, I think we need to practice being content with things being well sometimes, because there are going to be times of prosperity and peace, and there are going to be seasons of difficulty, but not to reject that peace and try to make drama because you feel guilty about it. Or like, if you're not coming under that attack, or if you're not feeling opposed, that you're going to, you know, that you're, that you're going to end up being outside of God's will. I know as a writer, for me, there are a lot of writers who um, write for escapism, you know, so like my life is so stressful, I have to write. Yeah. And I'm the exact opposite. I really like if, if things are stressful on the home front or something, it is significantly harder for me to write anything. And so what I think of it as is when things are going really well for me and I'm not feeling like I'm, you know, depressed or under this constant state of spiritual oppression or anything like that, I take that to mean that God is giving me um, kind of the green light to go and do things like this. You know, like if, if I were not in a good place, I wouldn't be doing this recording. I wouldn't be writing my Christian fiction novels that are hopefully encouraging readers. So I almost look at it as the opposite for me now. now. I totally have seen times in my life where based on the topic I'm writing about, yes, people around me or myself have come under spiritual attack. But I look at that as very much the exception because in general, I feel like, okay, I write best. <laughs> Let's not even say best. I write when things are going pretty well. And if things aren't going okay, like I'm kind of a big baby about it. <laughs> and so instead of feeling guilty, because some people do, they feel guilty and they'd be like, well, I must not be doing God's work because I'm not under spiritual attack. For me, it's almost the opposite. It's God is keeping me from oppression so that I can do this stuff. So just another way to look at it. Yeah, I think so. Mm hmm well, another interesting one, and I think you came up with this one, which was very interesting. I think it's something we don't talk about a lot, is that any bad thing, and this is a myth, this is, we're stating the myth, that mm -hmm. any bad thing that happens to you is from the devil. And you bring up the point that the devil is only in one place at one time. I mean, obviously there are yeah. demons, but Satan himself, you know, we rebuke Satan in Jesus name sometimes when we're coming under attack, like behind me, Satan, or, you know, not today, right. Satan, get, get out of here. But the devil is only in one place at one time. And that is scriptural and biblical. Mm -hmm. Sometimes bad things happen because we live in a fallen world. There's a sinful nature at, at work. Mm -hmm. There's sickness, there's death, disease, car accidents, human user error of, you know, <laughs> whatever. So right. the devil is not responsible for every single bad thing that happens to you. So not everything 
is a spiritual attack. Some things are just stuff, you know? Just yeah, like- some people probably will disagree, but I'll go ahead and use the word coincidence. Sometimes it is just coincidence. You know, you hit every single red light on the way to a meeting that you're really stressed out about. Could be God trying to get your attention, telling you to slow down. Could be the devil trying to keep you from that meeting. Could just be coincidence. <laughs> you know, sometimes I feel like maybe we do read too much into things. Um, and that's not to say that it couldn't be God. And it's also not to say it couldn't be demons. But sometimes it just is what it is because not even necessarily because we're in a fallen world, but just because some things happen randomly. And of course, God is still very, very much sovereign over that. Mm -hmm. And if he wanted to, he could have made every single one of those lights green. So I'm, I'm not one of the people who says that, you know, God just kind of, some people will say God sort of sets the rules and sets things spinning and then just sits back and watches. And I don't believe that for sure. I think he's very intricately involved in the details. Mm-hmm. but also sometimes a red light is a red light and there's nothing else to it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I used to think of, and I'm paraphrasing again, this, the, the verse in all things, God is at work for those who love him, who are called according mm-hmm. to his purpose. And I used to think of that as, well, God works all things for the good. Like God is taking something here and something here and making it happen mm-hmm. so that you'll, be well. And I've sort of come to interpret it as there are things that happen and for the good or the bad or the positive or the negative in our terms, God is at work in those things. It doesn't mean that he created, you know, a a horrible tragedy, but it means that yes, he allowed it. Yes, he's sovereign. But within that tragedy that he did not make happen per se, you know, like a death by disease when we live in a world that has disease, um, that in that thing, he is at work, which doesn't mean that he made that thing happen for your good, but he will work within that for your ultimate good. And I know that is a theological sticking point that could go either way. And I'm not Mm -hmm. saying that's gospel. That's according to Jamie, kind of my, my sort of revised interpretation. And I'm always open to interpreting differently. And we would love you know, with listeners, if, if you're not in agreement with any of these things, we'd love to hear discussions on this because we're just kind of talking right now about some of this stuff, but yeah. Yeah. The question of causality really is a big one, you know, (laughs) does God, you know, if God could stop this bad thing from happening and he doesn't, well, some people will say, well, then he therefore caused it and willed it. And other right. people will say, no, he just didn't stop it. And, <laughs> uh, you know, um, you know, and, and there are some kind of tricky verses, you know, like mm-hmm. I am the Lord who causes calamity, right? <laughs> you know, like that can't get away from that. Yeah. You don't get more specific than that yet. We don't attribute anything sinful to the Lord, you know, like he's, he's not wrong in anything he does. So yeah, you know, I, we're getting into the theology weeds, which, but it is an interesting, interesting question, but you brought up sickness, which I feel kind of goes along with this one we were talking about where sometimes I definitely feel like I have gotten sick because God knew that I needed the gift of rest. (laughs) And now I try to be proactive. I try to get my rest so that God doesn't have to make me sick. But I really do have times in my life where I can look back and say, you know, I I really believe that this sickness was a gift from God because he knew I needed to slow down. Definitely believe there are other times where sickness can be caused by demonic influences. You know, you look at Job, it was the devil who inflicted Job with, you know, his boils and all of that. And then we've got our third option, which, you know, is probably, maybe not probably, might be the most common. And that's just, yeah, germs are in existence. (laughs) Yeah. No, I I think it can go both ways and it's individual and independent of circumstance. But I think one thing we totally can take away is that not every single bad thing is from the devil. Right. And not all sickness is a demonic attack. However, Some sickness, I believe, can be, and this is another question of causality, does the physical sickness just make you more susceptible to attack, or is it you're being attacked physically and spiritually? But um, I got swine flu when I was pregnant with my youngest, 
And this sounds very melodramatic, but it did feel like surviving. And I never had to be hospitalized or anything. But I, there were a couple days where I really felt like I had to mentally tell myself to stay alive. And it did feel like a spiritual attack. You know, it felt like there was part of me that just wanted to give up because I felt so, so, so sick. Um, it was a, like I was close in age to my mom who died very young. So I was close to the age she was when she died. And so that came into it, you know, almost like the devil taunting me. Like I took her young, I could do the yeah. same to you. Yeah. So sometimes I do feel like sickness can at the very least make you very vulnerable to spiritual attack and maybe even be the spiritual, a form of spiritual attack. But sometimes you just get a cold because someone sneezed on you. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So what other prayer myths do we have? Oh, I like this one. A lot of people, this kind of, I guess, goes along with what we talked about earlier, but just phrased a different way. So if you're a strong enough Christian, you should be able to avoid spiritual attack. Or maybe this is the converse, you know, because we like the opposite. About, yeah. If yeah. you're a, a good, solid Christian doing God's work, you're definitely going to come under attack. But if you're a good, solid Christian who has enough faith, you'll never come under attack. Yeah. You know, it's these absolutes, I think, that, that make it to where it's ridiculous and obviously not truth. Yeah, I think so. And anytime we're putting emphasis on ourselves, I think is when we kind of, you know, slide down the slippery slope. And it seems mm -hmm. like if you're a strong enough Christian, you'll be able to avoid spiritual attack. You know, I think that's not necessarily putting the emphasis on God and it's putting the emphasis on, well, are you on strong you. enough to withstand That's a good the point. Enemy? Um, well, and you look at Jesus in the wilderness, that was very much a spiritual attack in every yeah. sense of the word. So you can't make the argument that, you know, a strong believer is not going to be attacked. Right. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So, what about, let's move into the practical. So if you believe you are under a spiritual attack, like what might be some of the signs of that and or what might be some of the steps that you can take to try to persevere your way through that? I think for me, I have, uh, my first line of defense is usually to ask for discernment because like we said, they're all different factors that come into play. And I think even in our prayer time before this recording, Alana, I said, you know, I don't know if, if you know, struggles that I'm going through right now are mm -hmm. vitamin deficiency or yeah. hormones yeah. or, you know, or maybe a spiritual attack or maybe not, you know? And so yeah. if it's a vitamin deficiency, if it's a hormonal problem or a diet issue, then waging war with scripture might not be the best approach to the problem, or at least not the first line of defense. Scripture is always fine. I mean, if you just went ahead and, you know, prayed scripture, it's, it's not going to return empty. I mean, it's always going to be mm -hmm. beneficial, but if you're ignoring something physical or ignoring mm -hmm. an issue that's not a spiritual attack, then you're kind of missing the forest for the trees. So I would, yeah, say definitely asking God at the very beginning, is this an attack? And confirm to me, like, how, how can I move forward? That's a really good one. Yeah. And asking prayers for others too, whether that's prayers for discernment to know if it's an attack, or if you do suspect that it's an attack to, you know, to ask for those kinds of prayers. If you're putting yourself in a situation where you feel like you might come under attack, it's good to get that prayer covering beforehand for sure. Yeah. And if it is spiritual, you know, it, it's a good question to ask if, you know, what, how do I pray? How do I even pray for this? Rather than just kind of plowing ahead, leaving some white space and some silence for scriptures to come to mind, or just start reading your Bible without an agenda and just see what jumps out at you, or just be looking for God to be speaking to you in that way, mm -hmm. because he, he will speak and he'll give you wisdom and guidance. For sure. Yeah. And I think that praise and worship is also just an amazing form of spiritual warfare and spiritual victory. So, you know, whether that's putting on some worship music or singing to God, um, 
reading through the Psalms. I don't know. Do you have any personal stories of what you've done if you felt under attack? I go into my garage a lot. And <laughs> when I feel like I'm being attacked spiritually, I will sometimes um, speak out like I've, I've in the past addressed the enemy, like in mm -hmm. war room, you know, where she's just right. like, Satan, not today. Go, you know, leave my family alone. We need a webcam in your garage. Wouldn't that be really fun? That would for me <laughs> too, because I don't know what I look like. I'm sure it's really comical. And so, it, but it's just, you know, speaking out um, scripture, praising God verbally, and th really the most powerful form of prayer that I've experienced, I think, in, in times of where I felt under spiritual attack is just speaking praise of God mm -hmm. for who he is. And like, uh, even giving thanks for some of the things that I feel are coming from a spiritual attack right. mm -hmm. in, and, and just saying, you know, literally Satan, you will not rob God of his glory. I'm not going to let you rob God of his glory or speaking to God, God, I will not let the enemy rob you of your glory. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this because you are sovereign because you're the giver of good gifts, you know, affirmations, you know, God is the giver of good gifts. God mm -hmm. is uh, not, doesn't withhold any good thing to the, the ones that he loves, you know, s biblically based affirmations I think are powerful too. Mm -hmm. How about you? Absolutely. Um, I think for me, music has been a big one. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of exact times, but just that, you know, it's really hard to focus on your circumstances or focus on the enemy when you're, you know, really absorbed in worship. Um, so that's kind of my, I guess my first go-to and praying with others too, I, I find can be really, really helpful. Um, yeah. Anything else that you wanted to add before we kind of wrap up? Another thing, just one last thing that I, uh, one friend in particular and probably others um, have asked for a group of us women to pray through her, her home and anoint the door frames mm -hmm. with oil mm -hmm. and just pray scriptures over every room of her house. And I've done that to my own house before you and I have done it to, yeah. you know, virtually mm -hmm. each other's praying through each other's homes with or without oil, there's nothing magical about it. And so just praying through your home using scripture is just another way. I just, I picture the act of praise and, and speaking scripture over your home or over your situation as being like um, water on the Wicked Witch of the West in the Wizard of Oz. Like, you know, <laughs> and, um, or like sometimes I picture it as being like those explosions you'll see on movies where it's like it explodes and then the after effects ripple out just for miles. Um, I just picture the enemy just being decimated when we do that kind of praise and prayer. That's really, really cool. That actually reminds me um, just in terms of like visual pictures. I was praying for a missionary friend who was going through a time of very intense spiritual attack. And while I was praying for her, I, I pictured her, you know, like kind of crouched down in a corner and I pictured all of this oppression, you know, just piling over her. And what I pictured, and I really feel, you know, I, I wouldn't go so far as say this was a vision from God, but I do feel like God was kind of using this mental image to give me um, just a, a way to like a metaphor for where, she, for where she was. And what I pictured was that my prayer was kind of like a force field or a bubble around her. And as my worship of God grew, that bubble kind of expanded and gave her more and more room, just kind of pushed back the darkness. And so, you know, especially I feel like on a podcast about prayer, talking about praying for others who are going through spiritual warfare is, is really neat too. And just remembering the victory that we have in God. And I love the story and I forget exactly which army it was, but do you remember the story where they were going out to meet the opposing forces and it was the priests who went first and they were singing and yeah. praising and it was just such a neat picture of worship as a form of warfare. Oh yeah. Um, I love that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, if you guys have comments or feedback for us, we would love to hear from you. And if you haven't picked up our scripture journal yet, we want to offer that to you at prayingchristianwomen.com slash journal. That is a free gift that we want to give you. And let's close now with our blessing and benediction. May the truth of God's word fill your heart today and set you free. May you rejoice in his word as one rejoices in great riches. May his word be sweeter than honey to you this day. May it dwell in you richly, accomplishing every purpose for which he sent it. May the light of God's truth banish all the dark thoughts and lies of the enemy meant to make you stumble. May your feet be planted firmly on the solid foundation of God's truth so your foundation will never crumble. I love that. And that wasn't even planned, but that just is very fitting for today's Mm -hmm, Yeah. And our benediction is 2 Timothy 4.22. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen.